Hey guys, before we get rolling here, I just want to thank those of you who have left me a review on iTunes. This helps me keep the podcast free, so please keep them coming. Tell your friends. I also want to thank those guys that have been sending in the questions. Um, This is what this podcast is about. It's about getting you the info that uh, you need to help become a better hunter. Uh, Now you can actually go to my website, interviewswiththehuntingmasters.com, and click on the Ask the Pro section. And you can send me your questions there, and you can even suggest a guest. And lastly, before we jump into this episode, I want to shed a little light on one of my sponsors, Sneak Tech Sneak Boots. Uh, I've been wearing them now for several years, and they've really upped my stalking game. I'm I'm not a very sneaky person, um, and I find that that extra added. Um, stealthiness that they give me has really, really improved my stock. I believe in them so much that I've decided to give away one pair each month to a lucky subscriber. So if you're a subscriber, once a month, I'm going to be announcing a winner to win a pair of Sneak Tech boots. So go ahead and go check them out at sneaktech.com and that's S-N-E-E-K-T-E-C.com. Let's get to the next episode. Hi, welcome to Interviews with the Hunting Masters, brought to you by TheOutdoorInsiders.com and the Sneak Tech Sneak Boot. This week, uh, we're, talking, we're talking to a buddy of mine, uh, John Huber, and uh, he owns Huber Concepts, and they build, uh, or they engineer, I'm going to say, triggers for uh, precision shooting, um, muzzle brakes. Uh, bipods and a number of other things that uh, are designed for long-range shooters and competition shooters and hunters that want to up their game. How you doing today, John? Hey, we're doing real good. Trigger guys ready for some information that I think anybody that hunts um, is is very accuracy driven. Uh, whether right. you're a hundred yards out or a thousand yards out. We're finding the trend to be able to do longer range shooting than most of us experience. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about what you do? I'm from Wisconsin, and most of our deer hunting occurs under 100 yards. Uh, So there's Mm -hmm. very few long range aspects that you can get to around the state. But what I think can be improved in most hunters' aspects, um, you have to remember that it's, it's... Physics, or ballistics is physics, and half of your mathematical equations are in time. All right, with that being said, you have to be, in order to be a good ballistician first, uh, you have to be good with your mathematics. Uh, And that's Mm -hmm. where a lot of the performances are driven to improve the function of the guns within not just mechanical standards, but mathematical standards, something that you can program in and exactly find your um, point of impact at 100 yards. Uh, And we're finding that improvements in accuracy are going well beyond one minute of accuracies at 100 yards, one inch, down below a quarter minute of angle accuracies, down to the level of arc seconds angle of accuracies. But wow. in the whole scheme of things, when you're out hunting, uh, and it's happened to me, I, I hunt deer up every year. Uh, a couple of years, the only time that I saw a deer was for a grand total of four seconds. Okay? Mm-hmm. So that means time comes into your realm of uh, function on your firearm real quickly. And most of the mm-hmm. time... Uh, they tell us, like in the military, it's it's 95% boredom sitting in your stand or scoping your, your area out, punctuated by moments of stark terror. You get buck fever, and that deer is so close that you don't have any control of your physiologies, and you start shaking. Okay, so time relevance comes into play extremely important. Uh, you can you can put all the money you want into the best gun, the best bullets, have a good zero on your gun, know how to maybe make adjustments for range. Uh, 
But the farther out you get, those changes to range really get uh, fancy, uh, fussy. They get extremely fine. And all the range estimations are considered an angle. Typically, in a hunting situation, you don't have a lot of time to make the shot on a particular animal unless you're stalking them and that's that boredom time coming into your shot. But most people, uh, at right now you and I are sitting here talking and our heartbeats are probably 72 beats a minute, which means uh, from beat to beat it's about 880 milliseconds in your heartbeat time. Uh, so you want to go beat, rest, beat, rest, be fire so that your shot can be coincidence with your physiology. Um, and that's just the start of it. If you don't think mathematically about the time to make the decision to fire at your intended target, your round will occur not in place on the target correctly. Think about mm -hmm. it this way. If you have a point on a line What's the width of that point? There is no width. But if you put that point in the wrong place, all the subsequent action occurs usually late. So if you, you're a millisecond late in your decision to fire when your eye says, I'm on target, and you're late, usually the round will be late occurring on target, arguably off target. So right. instead of thinking one second at a time, and we meter our entire lives on time, but we really don't understand how to choreograph it to our benefit. You have to time a car engine. You can overclock your computer, you know, John, but right. nobody thinks about the small time increments coming into that moment to make the decision to fire. It amounts to milliseconds. Uh, the rest period of your heart, for example, if the whole beat cycle is 880 milliseconds, the rest period is arguably under 200, under a quarter of that time frame. So that says you have uh, under 200 milliseconds of your heartbeat to find a moment that your platform is stable to say, okay, I'm on the target, my heartbeat's at rest, fire now. It's a very small window. Um, here, here's where it gets complicated. Your, your eyes are sending the information changes instantaneously to your brain, and it takes a few milliseconds to make that decision and send the signal to your finger to fire. All right? Now, mm -hmm. you can put all this money into your gun and say, hey, you got the best hunting rifle, but if you're not up to snuff physiologically and understand how your shot process is, you might as well stay home because you need to be able to time the moment. Um, mm -hmm. Here's an example. If you take a picture of grandpa in a one-second exposure, collect, you get a good picture of grandpa. But if a cat runs through that one-second picture, it blurs. What happens is, is it de denies you the ability to see the position and speed of that cat going through that one second. So in order to correct for that, think faster. I think in a thousand hertz buzz, it's on the piano somewhere over on the right hand between A and E, buzz, fire. That way, in the last second coming into your moment decision to fire, you get a millisecond picture of the reticle and the target as they come into coincidence and you have to say fire exactly now. Most people have no real good time references and they anticipate their shot and they swag it, they call Kentucky windage, they don't have a good grasp on their on their shot timing. Did you ever, John, mm -hmm. did you play musical instruments as a kid? I did. I played piano when I was a kid. Okay, real good. You know, I played a bunch of instruments too, but I was kind of tone deaf, so my music didn't really sound good to me and the, mm -hmm. the rest of the band, so they'd make me play drums, but I could keep a steady beat and keep a correct timing on it, and that's the key to it. If you can uh, know your lost time and movement limits. Uh, here's an example. 
take your trigger finger and push it into the end of your thumb a couple of times, and if you look at the flesh of your, where your marry-up would be against the trigger, you'll notice that your flesh does not rebound or respond the same way each and every time. That means if you pull up on a single-stage trigger, it's a swag every time. It's a unique event because there's so much lost time and distance in your flesh to break that trigger at whatever weight it is, you wind up using excessive force and speed and pressure, and it kind of shutters the rest of your grip at the same moment you're trying to fire precision aiming. So the trick is, if you use a two-stage trigger, which we find rings out your best timing application, the first stage will give you two metrics, position and poundage. Uh, for example, if you have a two-pound, two-and-a-half-pound, let's say two-and-a-half-pound is more normal to a nominal trigger weight for most shooters. If a hunter mm -hmm. says, well, I need three to 1,300 pounds, that's incorrect. There should be no relevance to your trigger pull relative to the weight of the gun. It should be comfortable. I prefer a light touch on my gun versus an overwhelming force to hold the rifle up and on location. Uh, if you uh, act with excess force on the gun through the shot process, you have all that stray energy that is going to affect your positioning at the moment of the shot. So I like to keep a lighter neutral control on the gun. It's something that it's more of an extension of you. You shouldn't have a death grip on it. So I try and give you a metric in pressure and position of the wall. Uh, to one pound, one pound, and the exact same position to the wall of the trigger. Now I mentioned mathematics is paramount here. The finer you can keep your mathematics to that point, the better. Now, most people think about time and their mathematics in linear terms. And in, in my work, I see time and the mathematics. I watch the exponents. They show you more than anything that, rather than the linear numbers. They show you a better correlation uh, that works good in time and your physiologies. There's a couple of things else that you might want to know about yourself. You can't feel your finger moving less than 20 thousandths of an inch. So I make my triggers accelerate below that threshold. So it almost feels like the trigger is breaking from the wall instantaneously to the moment you set fire now. So that's the meaning of saving lost time and distance is finding how to use the device to kind of overcome some of our physiology points mm -hmm. and put us in closer uh, perspective of where that moment of time is when you need to take that game in the best position. I know it's wait for it, wait for it, or sometimes it's like jump shooting deer. You have to make that coincidence of alignments in very quick order. So you have to be able to shorten that window up because it changes by exponents. It's almost like time is fluid in that sense. It changes uh, your attention. Um, think about it this way again. We're sitting here in an easy chair on the phone, 72 beats a minute. Now, mm -hmm. if you want to speed up your thinking, how fast do you have to uh, Reclock your brain when you get into a race car at 200 miles an hour or a jet at 600 miles an hour, you're thinking two miles ahead. And therefore, you have to be able to react faster than normal human reaction time of 0.44 seconds, 440 milliseconds. Uh, at that point, you have to think faster than your environment. You have to be faster. You have to have a faster trap than the quarry you're trying to catch. You have to have a faster trap than the rabbit. So at that point, that's where your time constraints come in. Um, when I said I had a deer in my face for four seconds, um, that's about the break point that most people take. About five seconds it takes for people to get on target to be able to launch the round 
in a timely fashion from the moment of target uh, acquisition. So it, it's all mathematical. It's all time-related. If you can think faster uh, in a millisecond frame in your head, choreograph your music and your art faster, it will give you an exponential improvement in your overall skills. This point can be illustrated the next time you go to the range on your same old gun. You're going to notice these little lost time and distance things in your trigger operation and your, um, the way you view your target through the scope. And I know we all got bad eyes. I'm 61. But this method of time constraints and thinking improves everything ar around you. You know, we get postured on time every single day. We get commercials every 21 minutes out of the hour to say, hey, this time allotment is making you pay attention in certain ways. So you get a very good handle on how long these commercials last and how much of your program you're missing out on. So your life is actually choreographed in time that we take for granted and don't understand the short moments. Now, getting back to the physics of all this, physics, the laws of physics are very unbreakable. They're very... Uh, they're easy to understand once you get there. I think they're uh, better off than the laws of man in that respect. Uh, and if you apply the proper laws of physics, you can do just about anything. Uh, our triggers, uh, I use exponents and rotations, and it's highly mathematical in the connection to the mechanical part of it. It's, you know, it's meant to be the last interface between you and your gun to make that time call. So it, it's more for the operator than it is a bling item for your rifle. Um, it's a timekeeper for your shot timing. Uh, it imp we believe we see three to four time or exponent improvement in overall accuracies uh, to that point. We apply physics through all our other products too. Uh, case in point, the muzzle brakes. Uh, muscle well, breaks before, we get into the muscle, before we get into the muscle break, John, yeah. let's, just talk, let's talk about your trigger here for a second. So the couple of difference, differences about your trigger, I mean, the obvious stuff is it's, it's a ball-bearing trigger, right? Yes. And a dual-stage trigger. Well, let's, let's, tell, let's tell people what a dual-stage trigger is. A dual-stage trigger um, as versus a single-stage trigger – you have to first feel the trigger, and usually it breaks in about 30 thousandths on a single stage trigger. Uh, but most people don't have sensation below about 20, so they keep the safety aspects set just above that. So just as you're ready to break on a single stage trigger, you're going to feel some motion on that trigger just as you break the shot. The idea of two stage is to get you your perspective of the trigger so that when you're at the wall, you, when you want the bone in your finger to move 10 thousandths, you want that trigger to move exactly 10 thousandths. Minimize lost time and distance in the marry-up where you have full bearing of the trigger on the uh, finger on the trigger. Um, and I use the exponents. I use rotations in the design. I don't necessarily use levers as such, or bell cranks as such. Um, it, it's mostly using circles and the exponents that are derived, uh, heavily based in calculus where you have to worry about the differential, which is the wall. We keep our walls very well defined. Um, we have a chart that we put out. It's uh, produced by a Dvorak instrument that's computer-coupled. It, it incorporates a stepping, uh, stepper motor, uh, um, a load cell, a timer, and the computer capacity. So we can actually control the form of the trigger, uh, the exponents of how it functions, rather than the linear terms of weight and distance. 
we get better control. It's uh, easier to make corrections for the particular shooter. Uh, we can cover a wide range of very personal aspects about this. I've produced on the same iteration in single stage as low as 0.271, a quarter pound break single stage, very short, very light, scary. Um, and we make our two stage aspects as low as a pound and a half. Now, I pick that number because most humans lose the perspective of a differential, a change in their weight pressures under half or three quarters of a pound. So if I can get you to pull up three quarters of a pound in the first stage to a distinct wall and in a very few thousands take out the remainder three quarters of a pound and very low energies to fire the gun, there's less likely that you're going to be too far distant in time or position to fire that trigger when you are aiming on target. So it's meant to minimize any lost times and distances. The trigger actually does accelerations internally to break faster than you would feel. So it feels mm -hmm. instantaneous, not like a glass rod breaking. It's an in instantaneous break. And we, we asked, where is the reticle on the target when the shot went off? And you can dry fire to see that moment every time you practice with your rifle or your gun. You'll see mm -hmm. the distinct time lags that occur here. And yes, I see exponents in time. Uh, so it's a very interesting field. Uh, it's complicated in hunting in that you have to remember that you're either tracking or trapping your target, all right? Mm -hmm. The deer could be moving into your shooting line, or you may have to track it and apply some sort of a lead, and you're going to have to guess range and, and speed of the target moving and still remember that you're a moving part. The gun is a moving part of this line with three different distinct points on it, so you're trying to put three points on a line at one time, it's a very short window. So you have to practice using shorter increments of time in your head to gather your information on what your eye sees to make that decision to fire. Right. So this honestly is like way, way over my head. But what I know is that I installed your dual stage trigger and I have a, I think, believe a two and a half pound trigger on my rifle. And um, I purposely didn't put it, when I first built the gun, I purposely didn't put it in right from the get go because I wanted to see what the difference was between my stock 300 rem trigger to going to this, to having the, the, the dual stage trigger. And okay. I mean, night and day difference for me. And that's all I needed to know. You know, I didn't need to know how and why and so why, how it worked. But um, I have you on here obviously today because I wanted you to explain, and, and you've done so in a, in a very detailed manner uh, of of how that works and why it works and why it makes those differences. Um, is there, since we're talking about trigger pull and you're talking about timing and, and everything else and how the, the, the ball bearing and the dual stage, how it uh, speeds up your timing and, and allows you to actually hold, you know, to get, to get the points on, so to speak, on the line uh, faster, or, or at least uh, more lined up. Are there uh, drills or practice sessions that you could recommend to somebody to further improve what your triggers are already doing? Does that yes. make sense? Um, we try to put as much of the technical and illustrative 
um, stuff on the website. The, the reason we don't have it adjustable, you can say, hey, can you make the adjustments? Absolutely. Um, but the problem is everybody's thinking linear, and, and the adjustments we make are in form, and that's where we mess with the exponents in there. So um, I would think if you can understand um, – in the military, they used to tell us it's 95% boredom punctuated by moments of stark terror, okay, in that respect. You train 95% of the time when you have to react for five, okay? Right. Um, I remember hearing a question that was directed to Wyatt Earp way back. The question was, how do you define or how do you think is a fast gun? And Wyatt Earp, he said... Well, most people are driven by fear to be fast. The guy to watch out for the, is the one that practices and does everything succinctly identical each and every time, and he does it in time. You can't beat him because he practices. He understands um, what, what you have to do is you've got to look at um, scales of resolution. If you go through your life thinking, looking at the clock, and you watch the sweep second go one second, two second, three, that's your time reference frame. If you can improve your reference, like grab a gear, think a thousand hertz in your head, uh, reclock your brain to think faster. Um, one of the PRS events that I thought addressed the time constraints really good was you had to go from standing to prone and make one shot on a target at 100 yards. The time constraint was you had to do it first in 10 seconds, then 8 seconds, then 6 seconds, then 4 seconds. And I found out that the breakdown in people's timing was about 5 seconds. So most of the people would either get down, make the shot in 10 seconds, they get down and they'd hit the target in 8, they'd get down to 6 seconds, they'd get down, make their target in time and time. But when they went to the 4 seconds, they couldn't put it all together to acquire their target in this motion and the time sense. And because of so much lost time in acquiring the target and getting comfortable on the gun to fire it, they lost and they didn't get their shots off. So it's a matter of, of how you practice your timing in your proficiency of your overall, your physiologies. I do monkey drills, bend and thrust, ready, begin. I practice snapping in from prone, sitting, and offhand with the heaviest gun I can hold up and try and let that muscle burn in. That's all muscle memory. That's about the meter of travel that your brain has to send a signal through when your body is saying, hey, I'm holding the target in your offhand position, it says, okay, only the trigger finger fire that round now. And it all has to work together. To me, like I say, with, with any gun, you can uh, accommodate for some of those lost time and distances, but it's usually in anticipation of that uh, as a result, uh, and you're close on target. But the better you can get at uh, how well you can hold in an offhand for a long two or three minutes solid before you got to put your arm down and take a, you know, a breather for a minute. But you'll find that after, I'll do it 15 minutes three times a day. I'll do my calisthenics, and I'm 61. Now, the real benefit is, is I take a lot of this information forward from 40 years ago when I was in the Marine Corps, Army Reserve National Guard. I taught hunter education, and I found that if you use all of these things, it will accumulate and improve your shot discipline. Uh, up until now, I had been mostly sponsoring range officer, spotter, sight, uh, scorer, and different functions on the ranges. And yeah, I even had time on tanks. We used to shoot 4,000 to 10,000 meters. So it's uh, differences in the external ballistics, but you're still hunting. Some of the same basic functions still apply to what we do hunting game animal that we want to eat, right? Right. Uh, and with that in, in respect, it's 
it's how you practice up. Um, I believe with time, um, coming into your next deer season, you're going to be fully prepared to, when, the, when you get out there, instead of going home and drinking beer for the previous six months, uh, you go out there and you practice your stuff and you're in the right place at the right time and everything's working the way it's supposed to be, you choreograph your art. But it takes practice. You have to build it into your, 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 yourself. Last year, not only do I try and send triggers out to various shooting teams and individuals, um, which national champions have been coming out of the woodwork lately. Holy smokes, they're taking advantage of the trigger and the knowledge of it. Last year, I was able to prove it for, for myself. I actually entered two months in a row in our Wisconsin Precision Rifle Steel Challenge. We shot targets from three to 600 yards. Uh, in June last year, I finished mid-pack with people half my age. Some of them are other good shooters, but I was mid-pack on about 30 shooters. I also had a stage-high score, which means... I beat everybody on one stage. Well, the, I went back to work being real happy, and the next month I said, I'm going to enter again, uh, except I didn't do so good. I failed to do one thing that's critical. For an event or hunting, you absolutely have to have a good zero and know your bullet velocities. If you don't know those two things, all the mathematics, all the preparation that you've done to get there will fail you. So by all means, have a good zero, practice, and you will succeed. Cool. Well, I want to get into your, uh, your muzzle breaks a little bit. Why don't you give me like a dumbed-down version of why – the, the physics behind muzzle brakes and why they work, and then tell me about yours specifically. Okay, very good. Uh, muzzle brakes are designed to cover a number of different things that, uh, because of a firearm, a lot of it's the concussion or report that they want to minimize, uh, the sound reduction. The, the primary purpose is to reduce recoil or minimize the flash. Uh, on the bigger calibers, recoil can be fierce. So you want to find ways that can minimize that. Uh, a heavier gun minimizes recoil. But additionally, what they're trying to use a muzzle brake for regarding recoil is to use some of that spent gas to uh, abate the recoil uh, in, as a function of the gun. Uh, I'm, there's various levels that they perform. Uh, same thing goes with flash hiders. Uh, the concussion that you feel, depending on if you're using a brake or a straight muzzle or a big caliber, uh, the, the concussion against your face can be extreme. Uh, in tanks, uh, we were evaluators. We had to be outside the tank when the main gun would go off, and the concussion was just horrendous. But that energy is all meant to reduce the recoil. The problem is there's secondary side effects in on all this, and it's still all physics. Okay? So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, say so on an M16, real, real quick, gonna... you want more uh, effect off the flash hider, but if you want a suppressor, it's pretty good at recoil abatement, but very good on sound reduction. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, relative uh, uh, to tr traditional muzzle brake, basically. So, I just want to what you said in a very technical way is basically uses the gases from the bullet or from the cartridge to pull the gun back forward to minimize the felt recoil. Is that uh, correct? Partially right. It's not meant to pull back on the gun. It's meant to. Um, Reverse the effects of the recoil going rearward, kind of like putting on right. air so brakes pull, pull on the gun forward. Yeah, but so the gun what forward. the problem the is is most of these brakes don't vent or port in a way that is as effective as it could be. Um, when you really think about it, 
once that bullet leaves the muzzle, you have a cartridge powder charge that's 40, 50, 70 grains of powder, which starts to come up on exact, you know, about the measurements of your projectiles. Huge amounts of powder energy. Now, once the bullet leaves the muzzle, that residue energy is at full power and it's at full velocity once the bullet breaks the muzzle. So you arguably have a gas column out coming out like a blowtorch at a two or three Mach levels faster than the bullet is momentarily. What I want to do is take the entire gas column, direct it through the brake, take all the energy I can to keep the brake and the rest of the gun from going anywhere. I want it to be a positional stabilizer for the entire platform. Now, the muzzle brake doesn't do a darn thing until after the bullet leaves the muzzle, but while the bullet's in the gun is when you get the recoil. So what I see using our brake is the recoil, once you fire it, the recoil starts pushing back. The bullet leaves the gun, and the brake takes that energy, and it's like putting it against um, a four to six inch square parachute that you're directing that gas column against. Most, most brakes out there do not control the pressures and the velocities in the same way. We try and use both the pressures and the velocities to keep the position of the gun and therefore the muzzle where the bullet's going from. The, the last inch of your muzzle is the most accurate part of the gun. So you have to know, make sure that the round is going in that same line. Uh, the idea is get rid of the gas column, use it, and not have it influence the gun or the bullet. So we've done that in such a way where by the time the bullet leaves the end of the muzzle brake, there's no gas column following it out the end. Everything goes to the side. Uh, our brake also does an asymmetrical uh, port pattern, which turns it into probably 22 to 28 different little vortexes, which has a, a pressure against the walls of the ports and produces a little low pressure in the middle of it. So it kind of sucks the pressure out and minimizes that pressure capsule around the bullet as it's passing out of the muzzle. So this way, you can, in very quick order, uh, eliminate that entire gas charge potential that's acting against the gun. Here's an interesting note, John. Most gun barrels are burned out in 5,000 rounds-ish. Okay, you could, you could shoot it longer, you could burn out barrels in shorter time. Let's say your barrel burns the accuracy out in 5,000 rounds. The round only takes one and a half milliseconds to get out of the barrel toward your target. That means the life of your gun barrel is seven and a half seconds. <laughs> Burp, go buy a new gun barrel. Okay, so gun barrel, scope, and your shot timer are the most critical things in, in any of your applications, be it hunting or target. You have to have a good barrel, have to have good mathematics and ballistics. Uh, you have to have a good scope for your eyes and a good trigger. And you're right. pretty much guaranteeing yourself you're going to hit everything you shoot at. As long as you do the right thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. For sure. So cool. Um, well, man, I, uh, I understand you guys came out with a new bipod. Tell me a little bit about this uh, bipod. Well, we were, we were trying to market a, a different bipod, and it was a foreign make, and we ran into some shipping issues, and we decided it's easier for us to create our own bipod. So we created a few prototypes, um, that we're going to be putting on our rifles. Additionally, um, we're working with another company with a bipod extension. Uh, and uh, these guys are pretty well up, and it's meant to be able to fit on most platforms from 
ARs all the way up to 50 BMGs. It's a stoke device, uh, and we're having good time with it. Uh, the more we use it, the more we're finding it has benefits in, in your long-range shooting. Um, as a matter of fact, you know who Kurt James Young is, don't you, John? Um, actually, no, I do not. Okay, he does a, a, another long-range podcast, but um, okay. out in New Mexico, they just had a couple of 50 caliber events. They had um, a 50 caliber match, uh, and they also had King of the Two Miles. As it was, oh, Kirk wow. James Young took the Hunter class uh, on that match with a 50 caliber. Actually, he was using a, a different gun. He was using, a, it was a, I think it was a 375, a high tech okay. gun. But they were putting all groups out there that were just stunning, four, five inch groups at a thousand yards. Um, wow. And uh, Garrett Flavored, one of the guns I just put in an AR-50, he actually finished fifth place at two miles. So he hadn't shot this gun for much longer than two months, and he's actually in the top five on accuracy out to two miles. <laughs> Crazy. There was an interesting I event. I could do that with my bow. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's um, timing. It's, it's yeah. all timing. Well, that's a lot to think about. Uh, I want to thank you for coming on and uh, sharing your knowledge with us. Um, if uh, if listeners want to find out a little bit more about you, uh, where should they go? Uh, Huber Concepts is uh, huberconcepts dot com is our website. We also have a really good YouTube channel. Um, we're also um, a good part of Rex Reviews. We were just down in Dallas, Texas for RX-17 uh, and giving some long-distance shooters um, a, a real good seminar on the tech, technicalities of long-range hunting. So we, ha we really enjoyed it, except for the high heat in Texas. But uh, we're finding out the ability to be able to shoot longer and farther is first in everybody's head. They want to be able to hit their targets as almost out to the point where they can't see it anymore. But this is yeah. really cool. It's They're finding a challenge they can actually meet. So this is all good. I've awesome. seen shooters in the PRS go from bottom to top in a season. Uh, we're seeing a number of national champions just start sweeping these uh, these events. It's a big one. Uh, we're going to be having people at uh, the Guardian, the Heat Stroke, um, Southwest Nationals. Uh, my exporter managed to take first place out of 440 shooters, I believe it was. So Beautiful. I think it's not just a combination of the components of your gun platform, but your discipline and choreography of how you utilize it and good mathematics. Right. Absolutely. Well, awesome. I want to thank you again for coming on, and uh, I'm sure I'll talk to you guys soon. Uh, say hi to Diz for me. Absolutely. Uh, we're always entertaining uh, people's requests on variations. Uh, we've done a number of military surplus rifles, uh, both single and two stages, so I'm well aware of the different variations that can be applied for uh, people's necessities. Uh, one new thing that we found out, uh, we're trying a couple other things with the ARs and uh, translations into other rifles, which is proving to be very interesting. Uh, but the whole, the whole thing is, is we're moving forward to better uh, appreciate the, the user's enjoyment in, in, this, in this sport and discipline. Uh, it can only get them to hunt better, more humanely. Um, you know, improve the chances of his shooting success and, and coming back with a smile and a ton of meat. You know, that, that's the memories Absolutely. that you're going to remember much longer than, you know, than missing one for some apparent mechanical reason. So, For sure. Well, thanks a lot, John. It was good talking with you.
and uh, I will talk to you soon. I'll uh, I look forward to seeing what you guys sure. come out with. Have a good one. Oh, it, it's uh, it's going to be revealing uh, in very short order here, so stay tuned. <laughs> awesome. Hey, guys, thanks for tuning into this episode. And remember, if you'd really like to help me out here and keep this podcast going, please go and subscribe on iTunes or on the Podbean app. It helps me keep this free and helps me keep doing what I'm doing. Thank you.